everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini-series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. In this episode, we're excited to share with you what we've been reading, watching, and or listening to during self-isolation. And to begin our mini-series, I'm going to turn things over to Reader's Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thank you, Sarah. So today I wanted to share with you a book that I just finished that I really enjoyed. It's called His Only Wife. It's by Peace Adzo Madi. It is about a young seamstress named Afi who lives with her a single mother in a small town in Ghana. They are kind of poor and they live with her uncle's house with his many wives and children. And then one day she's giving given the fantastic life-changing opportunity to be married to into the wealthy family of a gentleman who's named Ellie Gagno. And she accepts because it happens that his mother is her mother's benefactory. That woman's really helped them through the years, especially after her father passed away. So she has feels like she has an obligation to both her mother and um, her auntie um, to um, have this marriage. So she does accept the marriage and she finds that maybe it's not what she thinks she, it is. He doesn't show up to the wedding. There's a stand-in and she is shipped off to the capital city of Accra where she is put in a flat and she finds out that he's actually in love with another woman and they have a child and their family does not approve and her job is to win him back. It's just a really great book. You know, she does like living in Accra. She likes her independence. So it's just a really fantastic book that I do highly recommend. Second of all, I want to talk about it's everybody's favorite time of the year. It's the end of the year. That means that we will have our annual staff picks. They are here on our website. I will, there will be a note in the show notes below with the link. So you'll be able to see what we've all been reading this year. And, you know, we're looking forward to you enjoying our picks and uh, keep a lookout in the future. Um, we will definitely be having a print one that you can take home and look at. That's all we're, I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to hand it over to Katie. Thanks, Michelle. I'm keeping my mask on because I'm in the office, as you can see from my beautiful background behind me. Today, I wanted to talk about two books, three books, really. First one I wanted to talk about is The City We Became. This is by N.K. Jemison. She is a fantastic author. If you haven't read her 100,000 Kingdom series, it is fantastic. It broke uh, huge barriers in the sci-fi fantasy writing world. So Whenever I hear N.K. Jemison, I just think, like, visionary, like, just breaks through walls, like, fists out. She's fantastic. The City We Became is about the city of New York is turning into its own person. Once uh, cities get to a certain size, they can become personified. Uh, but there is a mysterious enemy that is trying to break up New York. So because this enemy is attacking, it breaks into all five boroughs of New York. So these five boroughs have to find each other because they've been embodied in different people. They have to fight against this enemy. So this sounds really weird, and it is, but the way that she writes makes it feel really natural. There's also a sequence that I really loved. This is on Tor.com for free, where you can read this one section of a chapter where one of the boroughs, Manny, for Manhattan, fights off this evil enemy by throwing money at it because they're in Manhattan. and. They have to buy back the land that they are standing on because they're at the place where Manhattan was purchased from the natives. It's really fantastic. I highly recommend it. Even if you're not really a sci-fi fantasy fan, it feels like getting to know a city. I really loved this book because it reminded me so much of like describing different parts of Chicago where they're like, yes, this place is terrible, but it's our kind of terrible and we love it. If you have aggressive love for your city like I do, this is a fantastic book. The second one I wanted to talk about is uh, Harrow the Ninth. This is the sequel to Gideon the Ninth. Uh, I'm not going to say too much because even just giving you a summary will spoil things, but this is one of those books where you absolutely have to read the first book to get into the second book. So as spoiler free as I can make it, Harrow is without her favorite Gideon and she is very messed up about it. She is having uh, trouble distinguishing fantasy from reality and she apparently has had this problem for a while but this is a really great twist on that unreliable narrator where it's always kind of like sinister and dark, but this is really just a troubled woman trying to 
figure out what is going on and how she can help in all this overarching global things. We see a little bit more of this um, necromantic empire that's going on. We see uh, the man who runs the necromantic empire, whose name is only referred to as God in the text, which is terrifying and fantastic. It also includes references to like highbrow art, like there's parts of Julius Caesar from Shakespeare that are referenced, and then the next line, it talks about nun pizza with left beef, which is fantastic. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, I put a link in here, so hopefully there will be an image of nun pizza with left beef somewhere. She puts in memes into her writing. It's fantastic. And the way that she weaves them through, it makes it feel very vital and important. There's also a lot of second person narration, which I was not really huge about, but then the narrator starts like inserting themselves and you're like, who the heck is a second person narrator? What is going on? This is amazing. So I highly recommend this. If you have read Gideon the Ninth, if you have not read Gideon the Ninth, first read that because you're missing out and then try do Harrow the Ninth. The third one I wanted to talk about is Beowulf, a new translation. The original Beowulf starts with the old English greeting, quit which is not really here in our language, it roughly translates to hark or low or like, hey, listen, this translator, whose name is Rhea De, De, De Havana Headley, she translates this as bro. Um, so she kind of turns it into this bro speak, this meditation on masculinity. This is actually her second work. Her first work is a reimagining of Grendel's wife or Grendel's mother in the present day. She's already like a crazy Beowulf person, which is fantastic. Uh, I really love her take on this, just her introduction. It's only like 20 pages, this introduction, but like I feel so much more educated about how Beowulf works and how she approached this and how she's approaching this as like this living poem instead of here is this one piece of fossilized culture that is here and we will leave, admire it and leave it forever. She's like, nope, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna turn it into something that conceivably could be told at a pub between two people. Uh, it's really fantastic. I also uh, included a link to, they are doing like a 25 days of Beowulf. So a lot of celebrities are reading selections of this translation of Beowulf. They're not all professional narrators and it shows, but if you wanted to see uh, celebrities like Ms. Cracker from RuPaul's Drag Race, Alan Cumming, uh, Neil Gaiman reading a new translation of Beowulf that does include a lot of F-bombs, I would check it out. It does not compare to the audiobook. Try the audiobook again on your own, but I think it's a great uh, introduction to this translation. So that is what I have, and I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Katie. I have two books to talk about. Uh, the first one is Dear Edward by Ann Napolitano, which was a new author to me. People kept requesting this book. We'd place holds on it, and then it came up in a previous Shelf Isolation episode. And I thought, that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll reserve it on Libby. It finally came in, and because of the annual staff picks deadline, I read it really fast, just because I wanted to write a review of it. It's so unusual. It's about a 12-year-old um, boy named Edward, who is the only survivor of a plane crash that kills about 200 people, including all of his immediate family. So he's adopted by his aunt and uncle, who try to give him a normal life, despite the fact the media calls him the miracle boy, and he's he's gotten very famous. He doesn't even know this. He's in the hospital. He gradually recovers, you know, physically and emotionally. And he learns, but just by accident, that he, maybe he's 15 or so, he learns that when he came out of the hospital, his aunt and uncle set up a P.O. box because he kept getting letters. You know, dear Edward, would you do this for me? And dear Edward, my aunt was on the plane with you. Would you do this? And there's like two big duffel bags of these letters he discovers, and he sets out to answer all these, or try to, try to you know, comply with all these requests that people have made. And that's the main plot, you know, his life. Interrupting that here and there are stories that are like flashbacks to the plane trip itself that tell us about people and their situations. You know, they're often making big changes, flying across the country, and they're apprehensive. So it was a really interestingly structured book. So I, I thought there were a lot of vivid scenes. I think these will pop into my head years later and I'll think, where did I read that? So anyway, it was, I think, a memorable book, memorable book and I recommend it. And my second book is something that just came in for me. It's called Operation Sock Drawer. And I'm not sure how well this will work. This is 
a book about knitting socks, and it was inspired by a famous designer's own sock drawer. The author is the Knitmore Girls, who evidently do a podcast I didn't know about. I think this book is somewhat above my skill level, but I want to show you a few of them. They're very creative. This is one called I Scream, and I'm not sure you can see. The foot is patterned like a waffle cone, and there's a layer of brown fudge, I would say, and some ice cream maybe even Jimmy's on the top layer near the cuff. There's a varig variegated sort of a flecked yarn. So that's ice cream. And, and the funny thing was none of these designers, except for maybe one, were people I had heard of. So they're from all over the world and creative. And there's one more. Okay, this is called Better Half. And you see the person puts her feet together. It forms a heart at the top. You know, they're very, they, they look a little bit um, involved. So maybe maybe in a few years. But anyway, if, you, if you're if you a knitter, you might want to look into this. And if you have somebody who knits for you, you might want to check this out and, you know, see how, how, how full you can get your sock drawer. Anyway, so next we'll hear from Catherine. Thank you, Karen. My first book is a history. This summer and all through this year, there has been a lot of debate about the role of the police and policing and a lot of protest. And so I've been trying to read more about the police themselves. I have not found exactly the book that I was looking for, but the one that I just finished is very good. It's called The Rise of the Chicago Police Department, Class and Conflict, 1850 to 1894 by Sam Mitrani. As you can tell from the title, this is a pretty academic work, but I found it to be really interesting. A lot of people don't really realize that modern police forces are an invention of the 19th century. And they've been around 150, 200 years. Before that, of course, there was policing, but it was done by the military, militias, um, and private security forces. And so this book doesn't cover the whole history of policing, just Chicago, but as it says, it's pretty representative. And basically how the Chicago Police Department got started was that the local businessmen who had a lot of money wanted um, basically more order to keep their workers in line. Their workers were always trying to organize for more pay, better working hours, et cetera. And so the businessmen did not want to pay for private security to do this. So they wanted the city to do it for them. But then of course, there was a lot of conflict because the business people did not want to pay their taxes to pay for this either. So that was kind of an ongoing struggle. And at the same time, the police department was really getting started. Then at the same time, the, as we know, there was a lot of labor organizing in this period. One of the big early strikes that the police were supposed to put down was over a shorter work week. The workers worked uh, five days a week uh, for 10 hours a day. And so on Saturday, they only wanted to work for eight hours. The business people thought this was completely unreasonable. And the police were not always on the opposite side of the workers in these struggles. There was also a plan at one point, um, the police were working effectively 18 hours a day, or at least they were on duty. They were allowed to nap during some of those hours, but um, there was this plan to add another six hours to that day for them. As you can imagine, this did not actually work as a practical matter. So basically it goes on, um, I found it really interesting, um, really just understanding more about the role of militias, even though that was not a topic of this book, but you know, whenever we talk about the Second Amendment, we talk about a well-regulated militia and everyone always says, what is that? Um, at this point there was, um, among the radical left, an attempt to raise their own militia, and they started drilling, and basically the powers that be came in and said that you can't do that, and they took it all the way to the Supreme Court, and they lost. They lost their right to arm themselves and form a militia. So all kinds of interesting things, and even issues that are still going on today, um, pretty much immediately the police were expected to start doing a lot of other things beyond their policing duties, like take people to the hospital, and, you know, they didn't have money to do this. You can see a lot of what is going on today um, was there from the start. So anyway, it's really interesting. It is academic, but I did not find it to be very dry. It starts in 1850, and then it basically all culminates with uh, the Haymarket Square bombing. And then um, that was what really sort of solidified the role of the police. On a totally different note, my other book is a novel, The Big Girl, Small Town by Michelle Gellin, which I thought was Funny and Serious, which is a type of book that I like. It's set in Northern Ireland. It's good if you're a fan of Dairy Girls, although there's a much more serious aspect to it. It's not just a comedy like Dairy Girls. 
is, and I think the time period is probably about 15 years ago. It's about a young woman who lives with her mother, who's an alcoholic. Her father, um, it seems, was sort of involved with the IRA. Um, he has disappeared. And it covers about a week in her life as she um, deals with stuff that's going on in her family. Her grandmother was uh, badly beaten and died of her injuries. No one knows who did it. Um, but meanwhile, she's just going to work at her job in a chip shop. And so there's a lot about small town life in here, just kind of the funny characters that you encounter. Um, our narrator is kind of, I liked her, but you know, she, she's a complicated person. There's some unlikable aspects to her. Um, let's see, why did I like, I think I really liked the small town aspect, the fact that it was very funny, but that it wasn't frivolous, that there's um, some real undercurrents of some real problems and where she's going to go from here in her life. So that is that for me this year, and I will pass it over to Sarah. Thanks, Catherine. So first, as usual, I have a recommendation from my two-year-old. This is The Story of Diva and Flea by Mo Willems and Tony DeTerlitzi. And I, of course, was very familiar with Mo Willems, Elephant and Piggy, Nuffle Bunny. Had no idea he'd written a chapter book. So this came out back in 2015. I was working in an academic library and totally missed it. But I've been looking for more easy chapter books to read with Henry. I like to read a chapter book at night rather than like going through a whole stack of picture books. We can read something like this in like 20, 30 minutes. But this is adorable. Um, I'll just show you some examples. He likes stuff like this where there's at least one illustration on every page. But this is a story of a dog, Diva and a cat, Flea, who meet and become friends, and it's very cute. And Diva is scared of feet, which is just funny. So, very cute. If you're looking for an easy chapter book, it's at about the same level as like Mercy Watson, Princess in Black. So, great for, it will be good for like a first, second grader to read on their own, but my two-year-old likes it as a read aloud, and it's super cute, and I kind of hope he writes more, but so far it's just a standalone. So, that's the story of Diva and Flea. And then what I've been reading, I listened to the audiobook of, um, I have to get the title right on this one, A Duke, the Lady, and the Baby by Vanessa Riley. This is a historical romance set during the Regency period in England. And the main character is a Jamaican sugar, her sugar heiress. And she's widowed as the novel begins widowed. She has a three-month-old baby. Doesn't Her husband, we find out pretty quickly, has committed suicide, but we don't know why or anything more about their lives. She has briefly been imprisoned, but was freed, and don't really know why. And the Duke, Reppington, has come to take over his cousin's estate. The cousin is her former husband, now deceased. The baby is his ward now, and he is trying to make the right choices to take care of this child. He doesn't realize that she's the mother. He thinks she's the wet nurse because she's in hiding. It's a whole complicated thing. But anyway, it was very sweet, um, and I specifically have to recommend the audiobook. It's narrated by Bonnie Turpin, who is an amazing audiobook narrator. She's very good at accents, especially African and Caribbean accents. She's Black. And the she does this Jamaican accent really well, but then also switches because it's a romance and it's both perspectives. And so she does the man's English accent well, too. So I highly recommend that one. And then finally, I'm currently reading One by One by Ruth Ware, which I know Jackie talked about on a way earlier episode of Shelf Isolation. So I wanted to re recommend going back to our previous episodes if you're still looking for something to read, because we've talked about a lot of books on here, and there's a lot of content to go back and listen to while we're on winter break. With that, also check out the staff picks that Michelle is putting together and are on our website. So yeah, we all have lots of recommendations from this year and you should check them out. And with that, I will pass it on to Will. Thank you, Sarah. 
Despite my acquisition of a PlayStation 5, my two most recent played games are releases for the Nintendo Switch. Who knew? Uh, the first is Carrion by Phobia Studios. Now, at the most basic level, Carrion is a well-designed Metroidvania. For those who don't know, uh, Metroidvania is a portmanteau of Metroid and Castlevania and refers to a specific subgenre of action-adventure games with platforming elements that have a large interconnected map that the player gains access to over time and will open up as upgrades are acquired and bosses are defeated. In the case of Carrion, it feels especially inspired by Metroid. The science facility where the game takes place seems to be right in place with many of the areas you would find in the 2D iteration of that series. However, the biggest difference that sets this apart and that caught my attention is that instead of playing a heroic bounty hunter trying to save the galaxy, Carrion flips the script and you play the role of a tentacled alien monster who is broken out of its containment unit and must destroy and murder its way towards freedom. Now, because it's a tentacled monstrosity, it has such a different set of movement than what's normally expected in a sort of platformer. You slither along the floor and on the ceiling and looking for vents and crevices to, for the ideal time to strike. But the levels are designed in such a way that it feels normal for humans to exist in this space with doors and stairs. So you definitely get a sense of that very difference and that very like alien sense that you have as you move from stage to stage and the enemies in the their weapons range from scared red shirts whose last thoughts probably involve lamenting how they weren't even supposed to be there today with soldiers that have tools that look like they're good friends of Samus Aran or Elden Ripley right down to the power loader which was not good for my alien friend at all. Now, you have plenty of tools to defend yourself, but you don't necessarily have access to them right away or even all the time. As you advance through the game, you expand in size, which will increase the amount of damage you can take and your strength levels. However, some of the special abilities you pick up only function when you're at a smaller size, forcing you to shunt powder of your biomass, their words, not mine, into a waiting pool so you can take advantage of certain abilities that are necessary to advance from area to area. Now, as of right now, this game is only available digitally on the Switch, PC, and Xbox One, but it's definitely worth checking out. The other game I've been playing is a quasi-prequel, maybe sequel, to the 2017 classic The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity is the second collaboration between Nintendo and Omega Force, a subsidiary of Koei Tecmo, who are best known for developing the Musou series, known by the Warriors moniker in the States. The Musou series is as much a game engine as it is a series. You usually find yourself placed on a battlefield with hundreds upon hundreds of endless mobs attacking while you are armed with some very powerful and exotic weapon trying to survive and accomplish whatever unique goal has been set out for you, which changes from area to area. The original games in this that use this engine, the Dynasty Warrior series, are loosely based on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, uh, one of the four great novels of Chinese literature. Now, due to its cult popularity, it is simply implemented into games involving different historical periods, including the Sengoku area of Japan and the Hundred Years' War, anime series like Gundam, One Piece, and Fist of the North Star, and most recently, other game franchises like Persona, Fire Emblem, and of course, The Legend of Zelda. Now, the first game that they did, like this Hyrule Warriors for the Wii U, later the Switch, was more of a mashup of characters from the series with a light story to justify why they're all hanging out together. With Age of Calamity, there's more of a focus on story as it specifically relates to Breath of the Wild. Uh, during the corruption of the Guardian technology by the Calamity Ganon, a single uncorrupted Guardian is shunted through time before the Great Calamity with a warning that could possibly change events for an alternate timeline. Maybe I'm too early in the game to say whether that goes that way or it's actually going to be in canon. What I can say is they've managed to port in the feeling of that Breath of the Wild evokes by using the exact same art style, along with giving you access to many of the characters that were introduced in Breath of the Wild, albeit a bit younger and more raring to fight. The game also has a distinction of making Zelda a playable character, something that's been requested by the fan base for quite a long time. It also made her a champ. She uses the Sheik Slate in ways Link could only dream of. You'll only find Age of Calamity on the Switch. And with that, I'll pass it along to Nancy. Thank you, Will. There has been a lot of talk this year um, about Catherine the Great, um, a couple um, TV series, both in Russian and English. This book, and as many of you may know, 
for most of the 18th century, Russia was ruled by women. And the first woman was the co-regent, later regent on her own, the wife of Peter the Great, Catherine, born Marta, a, a poor peasant and serf in the Baltics. And this book is not a biography, it's a historical novel based on Catherine's life, which sometimes I struggle with because you're adding all these historical facts and in-depth history, but adding your interpretation of her life. So it's kind of a mix. And when you create your own fictional character, that's really a lot of fun. But sometimes when you're reading this and you're trying to learn and put the pieces together, I wasn't quite sure. I'd say, oh, I didn't know that. And I'd look it up and of course it didn't happen. It was just in this, and it's not meant to be biography, but it is kind of a mix, writing a historical novel about a person. And the author writes very well, very clear, flows well. She did great research, I can tell. And it's a good book, but that troubled me throughout. And she makes little quirky things like talks about in the last chapter about Peter having bled, been bled by the doctor with a liter of blood. And of course, the metric system was not around in the 1720s. But all in all, it's just a well-written book and fun. And even um, without having to parse out the facts, what's fictionally created by the author is a wonderful book about an interesting time and a very fascinating woman who never learned to read and write, but ruled the largest land spans of the world at the time. Her name was Catherine and her name, birth, birth name was Marta. And one of the reasons Peter the Great could not get princes and kings to marry his daughters who were beautiful and, and brilliant, and one became Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia, was because they, he was married to a peasant. They called her the washerwoman. This is a fun book to read, very interesting, well done, and I think Catherine probably deserves more scholarship in the future about how, and it's hard to write about someone as well, to study the life of someone who was illiterate and did not leave their own written record, but Tsarina is a fun book to read and a good book to read um, about Russia and about a woman who kind of rose above having nothing in the street to becoming Tsarina of Russia. And I'm also going to share my screen here because we have a few fun things, not reading, but archives. And here we are. And I've shared from this 1928 programs um, from Ravinia before, which is online, but it's just kind of fun to read about the curl lash because you know, people still buy these, these fun little implements to curl their lashes and make their eyes pop open. I remember learning about them at summer camp, music summer camp, of course, and, and saying, oh, Nancy, you got to use this thing we shared, and we all curled our eyelashes, and it was very sanitary. I hope they don't do that anymore. But so it cost a dollar in 1928, which is about $16 now. So it was not a cheap little thing to invest in to um, beautify yourself in the mad 1920s. And there's, of course, many other interesting things in the same program. And also in our archives, we've seen from many times and many events, and I want to thank Karen for her help with this researcher who was kind of researching for nostalgia's sake, but he wanted, and his friends wanted to look at things from 1974 when they were in high school in Highland Park, and in particular, there used to be apparently a Christmas parade, and we have pictures of that said Christmas parade on our catalog. Um, most of them are also on DPLA, and apparently Santa used to come to Highland Park on a helicopter. So who knew? There's Santa coming to Hollywood Park on a helicopter. And with that, I will pass this off to Lori. Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. That was really interesting. I didn't know Santa came on a helicopter. Okay, so my first book, the only book I'm talking about this week, is called Running with Sherman. And it is by Christopher McDougall, who's a journalist who lives with his wife and children in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the heart of Amish country. And part of the book, he talks about meeting his wife and how they came to move from New York City to Lancaster County. And then he talks about how they live on a farm. And as I guess happens on farms, you start to collect stray animals. So he, this animal that shows up at his house is named Sherman. And Sherman is a donkey who has been rescued from an animal hoarder. And Sherman was so poorly treated that uh, there was question as to whether he would live. But he does. He makes a remarkable recovery. And then you get a really kind of delightful and heartwarming insight into how interesting donkeys are, which I didn't know. And then the running part is apparently in um, Colorado, there are these borough races where people actually race, they run like 27 miles with a burrow up mountains and down mountains. Sherman needs a job, I guess donkeys like to have jobs. So Christopher McDougall decides that he and Sherman are going to train to run this race. And then they drive across country and they run the race. And it's pretty good, it's kind of a feel good book. I, I recommend it. 
the other thing I wanted to talk about, I wanted to bring back the cookie, which Sarah introduced all of us to early in um, shelf isolation and then became kind of the first thing we did in our cooking with books series. And it's quite a favorite in my house. And we just recently made them once again. I think many people are baking this time of year and they're really good. So I wanted to remind everyone, it's always the cookie season in my house at least. And then I wanted to mention that um, you can find the cookie recipe on I put a different website there because you didn't have to go behind the paywall for it, but um, you can get the New York Times um, daily access pass through the library's website, um, our database listing. You click on the New York Times access pass, you click redeem, you, you log into a free New York Times account and you can read 24 hours worth of the New York Times. It's a great resource and it's a new one. Another thing that we added this year as we were all at home, unable to come in to read the paper or do whatever. And uh, that's it. I just wanted to bring up a few, a few golden oldies from this strange year. And now I am going to pass it back to Sarah. Thanks, Lori. And with that, that's it for today, folks. As always, please remember that we are all here for you. We are available for comments, questions, or concerns that you may have, and you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash hplibrary, through our Twitter, which is at hplibrary, or via email at hppla at hplibrary.org. Because the library's hours and services can change suddenly due to COVID, it is best to contact us via email or via chat on our website before coming to the library. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more information about this and the titles we mentioned in our show notes below. Okay, everybody, this is us signing off. Until next time, stay safe. <laughs>